Thank you, uh, Günther, and all the speakers. Uh, I've just been told that there is a one-hour delay in the speech in the Catalan <laughs> Parliament, so you're not missing out on something immediately now if we go into the debate. And Why would you tell me before? <laughs> And, and just uh, to, to kick off the debate, let me uh, try to do this uh, with the question that follows from what I've heard on, on the panel. Most speakers on the panel, in trying to explain the causes of the current crisis, have focused on the actors, the political actors, the party system. And they've, very, they've come up with very plausible stories on why the escalation. Uh, Basically, both sides seem to benefit as political actors currently from a strategy of brinkmanship and escalation. But uh, Günther just brought in uh, the kind of constitutional and institutional aspect, and that raises the question, what about other comparable uh, secession crises that were handled quite differently in countries like Canada, the Quebec case in 1980 and 95? Uh, and the recent Scottish independence referendum in 2014. And for me, that raises the question, isn't there also an institutional explanation to why the crisis was potentially uh, uh, possible already? And to me, that seems to refer to something that was also already mentioned, the kind of paradoxical uh, constitution of Spain is on the one hand, a highly centralized state, uh, you know, with institutions that uh, are, are not necessarily seen as representing all the different autonomy communities in Madrid, so there is an absence of the power sharing feature of most federal constitutions, and on the other hand, very extensive autonomy for the provinces. So the, the wisdom of most federal constitutions seems to be to have a balance between power sharing and autonomy that, to my mind, is missing in the Spanish case, and maybe for good reasons, because in the democratic transition, probably no other Institution, constitutional solution was possible. So that if, if the political actors are the problem, then the solution could be naturally change the political actors, and this is done in democracy through democratic elections. If the, institution, if the constitutional design is part of the problem, then the solution would be a constitutional reform or even a constitutional assembly, which also has been put on the table by some of the political actors. And I don't know what the answer to this question is, but I just wanted to uh, lay it on the table. You know, thinking about possible solutions is probably also led, in a way, by what we see as uh, the, di the diagnosis uh, of, uh, of the crisis. And the two stories don't exclude each other. You can have both. You, know? you can have a constitution that potentially results in this crisis and political actors that make use of this potential and drive it to the crisis that we currently see. I'm, I'm fairly ignorant about the, the context and the case, so I, with these uh, very open-minded remarks, it's just meant as a question, not as a comment. I open now the debate, and I ask anybody who wants to take the floor to do so, and we hopefully also will have time in the end for concluding responses from the panel. Jennifer. Uh, please also briefly introduce yourself, and, and please use the microphone that we have here so that this can still be recorded. enthralled by the discussion, you're right, it is terrifying. And I just want to give you two observations from the 1995 Quebec referendum that I've been thinking about a lot. A referendum in which um, I was quite active as a young person. The first observation was that, very similar to what Martin said, there was a moment in that referendum campaign where all of the rationale of the, what we called the Federalist side, so the nationalist side, was rational and persuasive. Your economy will be tanked, businesses will move out, it'll take, the joke at the time, it'll take a, uh, less time for Newfoundlanders to get to Ontario because Quebec will be gone. I mean, it was, a, it was a, uh, a conversation about rational argument and it wasn't working. The numbers were so, so close. And so the federalist side changed tack and it became a much more emotion-laden campaign for the last two weeks. One moment in it was busloads of Canadians from the rest of Canada came to Quebec during the last two weeks of the referendum campaign 
to campaign and say, regardless of what these high-level officials are saying, we want you to remain in Canada. So this question of families. The other was a um, moment during the referendum when there was actually a figure from Catalonia who came to Quebec. And I remember at a rally, we were telling him all of the, and goes to Reiner's point, all of the powers that Quebec had in the Canadian system. By the way, that Supreme Court decision that was put up on the board was made by a court that had a large number of Quebec judges. So it really shows you the balance. And this Catalonian politician said, my God, if we had all these powers, we wouldn't be asking for independence. And it was a, it was a very funny moment. But my question, sorry, is I think a key part also of why separatism has been held at bay in Canada, and it's been held at bay, it's not absent, is also because of the nature of political parties. And I said this to Marta on the way up, that there, has, there have been truly national political parties in which Quebec politicians have played a prominent role, alternating as prime minister of the country. The current prime minister of Canada is a Quebecer because there are national parties with a broad membership and there is a joint stake. And so my question is just an innocent one. Why don't those sorts of political parties exist? Why hasn't there been a recognition of the need that underneath the law and the legal system, there must be political parties that integrate these different sentiments? Because I would wager that without that, I don't think today we would be living in a, in a Canadian federation that looks the way it does now. I think Quebec would have separated. Uh, I also want to thank you for, uh, for opening this debate, but um, I want to question a little bit this uh, emotion-rationality dichotomy that's kind of permeated all the speeches except Marta's, which I think, I think the feminist element kicks in, in questioning the emotional-rational debate. And I want to question it basically for two reasons. The first one is that, as we have also kind of witnessed, Emotion is always ascribed to the Catalan independentists, and rationality is always ascribed to the Spanish government. And I think this hides the emotional uh, element behind what Spain, the Spanish government is doing, and it hides the Spanish nationalism that is behind, um, you know, Spanish government's actions. Um, I think you can only understand what the Spanish government is doing if you ascribe it to a Spanish nationalism that is hiding behind legality, uh, which it also uses kind of selectively because it's also against the rule of law to use abusive police powers, but this is not a problem for them because they're defending the constitution. And I think one of the things that we haven't spoken about, and it's only been Marta who has highlighted it, is that what Spain is trying to, def well, what the Spanish government is trying to defend is the whole 1978 consensus uh, of the constitution, which Territorial uh, organization of the state is one element, but there are loads of other elements, which uh, I think uh, Martin uh, would agree are also part of the nationalist arguments. So it's not just about territorial integrity, it's about questioning the whole uh, national myth of, the transition, of Spain's transition to democracy. And I think only in this line can we understand the king's intervention, because the king is part of that consensus of 78. So I think um, dividing rationality and emotionality between Spanish government and Catalan government is dangerous because it hides all these, you know, Spanish nationalist dimension, which is one of the main explanations for what Spain is doing. I think separating uh, emotion and rationality is also dangerous because I think an emotion, you know, the way it's portrayed by people who separate it is that emotion is dangerous. You know, it's like it drives people crazy and that's the kind of language that's been used to undermine Catalan population and government, but I think emotion can also be part of the solution. So the whole wide demonstrations of solidarity from the rest of Spain with the uh, police uh, attacks to the voters is a sign of emotion. Uh, I also think it's true that the Catalan argument has divided friends and family, but it's also the other way around. So friends and family have overcome the problem and spoken about it in a much more dialogue way, thanks to emotions like love and family. So um, this is what I wanted to say. Oh, and I also think it's an institutional thing that's being hidden by this idea of, of emotion 
uh, because this drives you to look at actors and not at the actual you know, consensus of the 78 that's behind it. And this is an institutional dimension. Thank you. Uh, Francesca Galli, I'm a Germanet Fellow here at the Schumann Center. Um, I wonder, uh, thank you for the debate, first of all, very enlightening. I, I wonder simply whether um, you can establish any comparison with, between this, uh, what is happening here, and the Scottish referendum. Not obviously how formally it came along, but rather uh, this relationship you have highlighted between local institutions, national institutions, and uh, institutions and people. And maybe if uh, both sides could have learned something from what happened then, because it's not so long ago. And it's in Europe, it's not like a back. Thanks. I take advantage of the closeness of the microphone. So uh, I've got a question for Reiner that relates to the uh, Scottish referendum. So I'm Fabrizio Bernardi from SPS. So uh, in, in this referendum in Catalonia, EU citizens that were resident in Catalonia were not allowed to vote. Uh, so they couldn't vote while they could in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, and I wonder just uh, to Reinhardt that studied this topic, how this can be uh, an issue also in the negotiation with the European community. Uh, these were 300,000 people uh, that are residing in Catalonia, 2 million votes, so it's about 15% of potential uh, voters that decided to live in Catalonia and could not uh, vote. So, a small question. Thank you, first of all, thank you for these very interesting presentations. And uh, uh, I am a new fellow uh, coming from the Commission and I happen to be from, from Madrid. I just wanted to, to say that, um, I mean, I think in, 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 in looking at this problem, I think it's important that we try to remember where all this comes from and maybe why your situation is different from Scotland. I mean, the Constitution of 1978, which is one of the longest standing constitutions in, in our history, I think, and has uh, created a lot of stability, prosperity in Spain uh, was, the dif was the, I mean, we have to remember the historical context in which it happened. It's the result of a very difficult compromise between re Republicans, monarchics, uh, right wing, left wing, people who were in favor of, uh, of uh, autonomy or na nationalist and, and non-nationalist. And in the end, uh, we, they all yielded. The, the Republicans forgot their aspirations, the, the left wing and the life, right wing uh, converse, and the nationalists uh, also accepted that. It's a very federalist constitution. I, I, Professor Bawok, uh, I think you were questioning that to some extent, but I understand, I'm not an expert, it's a very federal, one of the most federalist constitution, even though the word federal was not used, partly not to provoke the right wing when the constitution was, was written. But the point is that all this thing, all this framework is being questioned, and uh, it's, it's, it's a consensus, it's a historical consensus, so it has to be respected, no? And that's, uh, and I would also like to, uh, to, to say that if you push the nationalist uh, uh, argument to the, to, the, to the limit, which would be unconstitutional, but okay, let's play with this argument. Why should therefore not Barcelona or some of the regions that are in your map are very reddish, uh, uh, have the uh, right to, 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 to decide on a referendum? Because we know that uh, 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 polls and uh, elections show that Barcelona is predominantly uh, against independence. I mean, like 60, 70%. Should they not also have the right? And that gives, takes you back to the fact of where is the nation? In Spain, the nation, as we agreed in the Constitution, we can change it, but that's what we agreed, is not in the, uh, e, e, one of each of the territorial units of the, of the country, but it is in the whole country. So if, if, if we want to accept that some regions may elect their future, which is fair, fair but then could we also de give this right to the, to the cities, to certain uh, municipalities, to to, to decide on their future. Yeah, is it working? Thank you. One question for everybody. If, uh, because uh, Professor Vuk uh, said that maybe, maybe one of the possibilities is to change the political actors from Catalonia and, and Spain. I foresee that the, the, the Prime Minister of Catalonia will resigned, as he said, I, I think that Rajoy will continue. What about the possibility or your opinion of the possibility of uh, mediation, international mediation? Yeah. 
Okay, th th thank you everybody for your presentation. It was very interesting. I, I wanted to ask you if you could add a little bit more about the role of the European Union, but I think many of us were disappointed of, for the lack of a real political answer. I mean, the fact of only mentioning an internal matter shows a, a, what, what for many of us, of us seems like a double standard. I mean, if this had happened in Hungary or in Poland, maybe the, the answer would have been another one. I mean, so th there was like a, a lack of... Uh, Obviously, the, the, the legal the logic in which we're all, all, that many of you explain is very complicated, but at least another position could be, show, could be shown. I mean, we, we saw, I mean, 800 people injured or around that figure. I mean, and there was no clear con condemnation of violence. I mean, and, and in a certain sense, that shows like a double standard considering how the European Union reacts in other scenarios, no? And, and, and that also shows how it, it, there's a need for also a political mediation. So if you could add a little bit more of, of how could be done a, another kind of political answer and not just saying it's an internal matter that it seems like it, it, it creates a void. And in, in, many, in many senses, when in politics there's no action, I mean, it could be the, the worst scenario for, of, of all, I think. No? So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions right now, I suggest that we have another round at the, uh, on the panel, on the podium, and then we see if there is time for a second round. And I suggest that we do it in reverse order. So starting with Günther, if you have any comments, and then Marta. And I happily pass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that um, uh, the comments made by um, Lucrezia uh, I partly agree with that, that uh, I think that uh, the activation of the Spanish nationalism is clear and is there, and it has uh, contributed to the polarization of the situation in a very substantive way, I would say. Um, and, and I think that there is a kind of a, a um, like diabolic vicious circle in this, and all of them are responsible, equally responsible. The other thing regards the possibilities of mediation. I think that uh, it's quite difficult because no one of the two actors think that they need a kind of mediation. And it brings me again to this, I will not say emotional, but well, let me say it, testosteronic way of thinking about uh, uh, polit politics. I mean, I think that there should be a position in, this, in, the, in the scale that uh, Carlos was presenting at the beginning, there should be a position in between a status quo and independence. And, and political actors should find a way to dialogue. No? Uh, this is my, my opinion, but I don't think they are able to recognize an external actor. Perhaps, as uh, uh, Jennifer was telling, a Catalan uh, uh, politician who has been in Madrid for a long time could be a possibility. But uh, there is a lack of uh, this kind of political figures. There are some ministers, no? Mm -hmm. But, uh, but not, not, I, I wouldn't say they could be recognized as you know, state men or women. Personally, I think Ada Colau could do it. But of course, this is my personal view. Thank you. Two quick points. So um, I think it's also very, uh, I agree with Guillaume's point on it, the whole story being very scary uh, in terms of a social breakup in Catalonia. But I think uh, on the Spanish side, this is actually quite present as well. People showing off highly committed positions, uh, highly unionist, as people, uh, such, some of us who I'm not Catalan, and we t I, I personally take a more nuanced approach to the whole topic. Even some of us, Guillem can also testify for that, have been recently exposed to Spanish media and sort of high, trying to promote uh, bridges between sides. And it was not only um, disappointing to see some of the comments some of these comments we have already made it to an English speaking audience, no problem about that. They are not highly contentious, but we did it uh, into the Spanish media yesterday and today, and even some of our articles have, have got really, really sort of um, strong reactions. Sort of, if you take a more nuanced approach, you are showing sympathetic supporting our case to, to the nationalist cause with, without being ourselves, not even Catalans. So.
Just want to say that uh, it's very difficult, it's horrifying. I have uh, had a lot of discussions with friends, with family, and every day um, it's really sad uh, to levels that I have never thought that uh, a few years ago I would have reached with my friends and my family. Uh, even we end up almost shouting and every, every time hate, uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's really present. And so it's not been easy. I think that the only solution that, uh, that, that, that we can expect is that maybe the Podemos and the Socialist Party try to do a bit of confidence and kick out the right-wing political uh, party, PP, uh, from government, then, then try to change the constitution in order to allow a kind of, uh, of referendum with all the democratic guarantees, and then try to do finally I know it's very difficult, uh, a rational debate. The only problem is that there are people in both extremes that they don't want to talk more. They just disconnect. I don't care what the Spain says. I don't want, I don't want, any, I, I don't want to hear any other uh, rational comment from one side or another. So they just disconnect. So it's really difficult. I can try to say one thing, but they, well, like with, like, like, like with my friends, they, they begin to insult me or I am a Nazi, or I am a fascist, or blah, 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 and it's always the same, you know? Even my, my father says, my, my father, and just to finish, sorry, that um, if you are in uh, pro-independence, you, you, you can say it, you, you, you can put a flag on your, on your balcony, but if you are not independentist, you cannot say it, and you cannot have a, a lot of opinion. This is what my, this is what my, this is what my, my father said, because my, in my neighborhood, he is the only one that he puts an European U Union flag. And then all the people in the neighborhood said, ah, look, this is the fascist. So all the people say that my father is a fascist. And of course I have friends, and the majority of my friends are pro-independent, eh? but uh, this is, I also want to show what my father uh, thinks, so it's, it's really sad. Yeah, just uh, two really quick points. As to what Jennifer was saying, I think these two dimensions of, uh, are really important, this power-sharing power dimension and this self-government. And I think that's, uh, there's some data on this. I saw a graph recently, and you really see that on the power-sharing level, it is really low, whereas on the self-government, it's, it's really high. So there's, um, that might be a potential solution, maybe encouraging this power-sharing dimension. I'm not an expert on that, so I won't go. Uh, any further. Um, but just to, to what Lucrecia was saying, um, yes, the fact that they're on the side of the Constitution, that does not mean that they're not nationalists. And in fact, what we saw yesterday in Valencia, we saw some fascist attacks on the streets, it points on the direction that Spanish nationalism was a, uh, a sleeping giant that might now be uh, waking up. Um, but I also agree that the emotion can be part of the solution in the sense we've saw on Saturday these demonstrations of Parlem Hablemos, which is this uh, movement of citizens that organize spontaneous demonstrations across Spain and even outside. And they all went there with white and white flags and asking for dialogue. And that is an emotion of fraternity that might lead somewhere. I don't know. For now, it's a minority. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it there. If I may, before I give the floor to Carlos, I will address the one question that I got from Fabrizio, <laughs> right? Because it's a side aspect of the whole thing. And that was the question, why uh, shouldn't EU citizens be enfranchised if there were a properly uh, agreed uh, Catalan independence referendum? because they were enfranchised in the Scottish referendum in 2014. So the empirical answer is fairly easy. Uh, in Scotland, EU citizens are allowed to vote in Scottish Parliament elections. In Catalonia, they are not allowed to vote in Catalan Parliament elections. So it's the existing parliamentary franchise that provided the basis for uh, who is enfranchised in the Scottish elections. Uh, the reason why this is the case in Scotland has something to do with the fact that the UK is not a federal state. Uh, they had to invent a franchise when uh, devolution took place and the Scottish Parliament was established. And they said the only franchise that we can use without setting a precedent for other regions in the UK is the local franchise. And under EU law, in the local uh, elections, EU citizens are enfranchised. So therefore, they upscaled the local franchise to the regional level uh, for the Scottish Parliament elections. 
Uh, now that is the empirical answer. There is also a normative question that we debated in 2014 on the citizenship observatory. Should the franchise be different in an independence uh, referendum? So shouldn't the people, uh, uh, you know, EU citizens who are deeply affected by the outcome be enfranchised? Uh, my, my position in that debate, uh, maybe I was a minority, was uh, no. You cannot possibly change the franchise preempting a potential outcome of a referendum. You have to go with the franchise that is already in place. You cannot say because independence might result, but in fact it didn't, so it was not a necessary conclusion. Therefore, we already enfranchise those who might become the citizens of a future Scotland, for example. You can only work with the franchise that is in place because the decision is whether a region will, be, uh, will change its, inter its status from a region within the state to an independent state, and you have to, work uh, you have to take the regional franchise as the basis for that decision. So that was a long and winding answer, but uh, in, in Catalonia, of course, the problem is, in the, fir uh, the first problem is to get some kind of legitimacy for an independence referendum that in, this, in, the, in the UK case existed because there was an agreement between the Scottish Parliament and Westminster. In the Quebec case, it was, was much more contentious, right? But in the end, you know, there was uh, an agreement that there would not be any attempt by the federal government to prevent the holding of the two uh, independence referendums in Quebec. The Spanish case is different, and the most worrying aspect is there is no agreement of that kind in the Spanish case. Okay, so thank you very much for the questions. I'm going to try to say something to all of you. Starting with Jennifer, very interesting question about the, the structure of political parties and the inability of Spanish national political party and the ability to integrate Catalan politicians. I think this points really to part of the, the problem and is related to a topic which is very keen to me, which is the collapse of the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party, whenever ruling Spain, was, was support in Catalonia. It became the biggest party in, in Catalonia between 82, Marta knows better the, the data, but was between 82 and 90 something, right, 90, 96. And the Socialist Party had a strong component of Cat uh, Catalan politicians. Uh, some of them very well known and uh, first line politicians. Uh, so um, I can mention, yeah, Borrell, well, but not only Borrell because of a contentious name, but, uh, you know, Carmen Chaco and some others, quite a few of them. The collapse of the Socialists, I think, is one of the key elements to understand what is going on because part of the Socialist Party in Catalonia has defeated to the to uh, Esquerra and to the neighborhood of the pro-independence movement. So this is a crucial element to understand what is going on there. The PP never had a strong root in, in Catalonia. And again, this is a part of the problem. Why so? Because the conservative part of the discourse has very well taken over by Convergencia Unión, which does not have the past of the PP, but has the whole ideological program. So you, you just listen to Mas, uh, which is the former leader of the CEO, uh, the speech of Mars, the discourse of Mars about uh, ideological preference is exactly the same as Marion Rajoy. It's, it's incredible. It's liberal, uh, austerity, and uh, things. So this space is already taken in Catalonia, and it will be very difficult for the PP to penetrate. Uh, that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the explanation, but you are right. The, the lack of a party who can structure the Catalan elite, uh, or sorry, Catalan representation at Spanish politics is part of the problem. The question of Martin, uh, that you are trying to call me because I have this kind of mixed identity. Um, I am here kind of a political scientist and a, a little bit, just a little bit of a lawyer. And um, I would say that the problem with your question is that the European Union has the very bad habit not to behave according to international law, but rather to behave according to European Union law. So whatever ter territorial integrity means is according to European Union law, not to um, <laughs> international law. So. I think we have to agree to disagree on this point because I don't think what the interpretation that will prevail will be international law interpretation, but rather if there is a possibility that the European Court of Justice adjudicate on the meaning of territorial integrity, that will be their interpretation that prevails. Lacking that, I think any other institution will fill this vacuum in a kind of very creative way if it happens. But probably we have to agree to disagree that you say that the international law interpretation is the one prevailing, I would say, I do not think so uh, within the European Union. Lucrecia point about emotions. I didn't say that emotions do not permeate the PP at all, and do not permeate the Spanish nationalism. So I don't know much about 
how to articulate theoretically the relation between emotions and rationality in decision making. What I am saying is that in normal speech, in normal parlance, in uh, everyday discussions, uh, there is a point in which emotions are very extreme emotions, and we have heard here people referring to families and things, have become to the point that uh, normal dialogue is, is, is impossible. So I just pointing in that, in that direction. But I also would like to underline one thing which is particularly problematic in this debate, which is part of the Spanish emotional discourse is totally blamed, excluded, and labeled. Roger just said that by flagging or having a flag, the European flag, you are calling fascist. Here there are people from many other nationalities. Could you imagine any of you having a European flag and being called fascist? And I cannot tell you what happens to you if you have a Spanish flag in certain environments. The, the, the word fascist calls very, uh, comes very strongly. That plays very bad with emotions and feelings of certain people, and we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that there are problems with the feelings and emotions in one side and with the feelings and emotions in the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, can put you on a very clear example. Uh, former President Mas came once to a declaration and said that the Catalans spoke Spanish better than the Galicians. Uh, it happens, it occurs to me, do you remember this declaration? It occurs to me that I am, I am from Galicia, I think Martin too, so we are two Galicians in this table, that's impressive. It's a, a very good show of, uh, of uh, plurality. We do, I, I do speak very bad any language, and uh, I think that's very evident. But I can understand that many people felt a little bit injured or affected by this kind of declaration. I mean, what this has to do with the, the Galicians, which are there in the Atlantic and uh, speak some kind of Portuguese, uh, we speak some kind of Portuguese, had to do with this kind of derogative thing. Or when you say to people, Spain is still from us, you, you don't say, you don't construct it in a sophisticated way. You are saying, you know, our money is paying for lazy people in Andalusia. It's not a question about, really, about whether it's true or not. It's a question that that hurts people's feelings and emotions. So what I would say is that if we have to have a proper conversation, emotions and feelings have to be respected in both sides and avoid this kind of language which is very derogative, uh, calling, calling names and saying things to people. I don't know much I said uh, about the relation between emotions and rationality, so I won't go into that direction. Um, then, Francesca, the question about Scotland and Catalonia. This is a long question. I mean, that will take us uh, a long time, but I would put it, and it's very unsatisfactory. I, I understand my response. The, the, the main difference, uh, well, there are, very few, there are quite a few differences, but a very important one is the flexibility of the, uh, of the uh, United Kingdom Constitution that gives a large margin of maneuver to the government and the majority in parliament. So if you have that, you already have a big uh, structure. In Spain, even if the government wanted to do something, you have to have a three-fifths three majority to change the constitution. I can tell you in 2003, 2004, when the discussion about the change of the Statute of uh, Catalonia was discussed, I was in an office next to the prime minister, and we were backing up all the discussions about constitutional reform. And we came to a very clear conclusion. You can do nothing in Spain in terms of constitutional change without having PP on board. And it's not because they are nice or whatever, it's because they represent a significant part of the, of the electorate, which is around 30%. And if you have uh, to gather three-fifths of the parliamentary votes, you need always the PP. And the same goes, of course, if you want to do something in Catalonia, you cannot ignore, well, now the things are changing a little bit, but formally you couldn't ignore Convergencia, that's totally sure. So there are these two players. I think in the United Kingdom is not the situation. That changed totally the game. Now, Theresa May can say simply by just looking at his, her par parliamentary manager say, we are not prepared to enter into negotiations with the Scottish government, full stop. And we are back by a parliamentary majority, the affair is more or less closed. So I think that, that explains a little bit the difference in between two cases. There are more uh, issues that should be taken into account, but perhaps we don't have much time to reflect on that. Um, the question of, about international mediation that was raised by PEP, um, uh, apparently, Puigdemont is uh, the option that is trying to find, uh, to try to, to pursue it today. Uh, postpone a declaration of independence, trying to find uh, international mediation. The, the problem here, I think, is that uh, the Spanish government, I don't think, that will accept international mediation, because international mediation somehow has got a strong assumption from the Spanish government point of view that Catalonia is already a sovereign entity. You know, so international mediation happens between 
parties that are recognized at the same level. And that creates a kind of very difficult uh, element for the, for the Spanish government. So because already recognized to uh, Catalonia the status quo to which they, can ar they want to arrive before negotiations start. I don't know whether I'm making myself clear, but it's not a winning point for, uh, for the central government. So mediation, I think, is out of the question. It's totally different to, sp to speak about negotiation. Uh, mediation is a different concept, and I think what is more possible, perhaps, is uh, negotiation. Um, the role of the European Union that someone asked in, in relation to, um, to violence. Um, I am tempted not to respond to this question because uh, I have a not so positive, um, or perhaps, or rather, I don't have a line of agreement with you. Uh, and the point here is that if you want to do that, then there must be a significant overhaul of European Union powers in terms that internal matters related to um, security should be scrutinized by the European Union. And why I'm saying that? Because you look at the story of the European Union in the last 15 years, what you find there is huge demonstrations in Genoa in 2001 with one person killed, huge demonstrations in, in London, I think it was 2016, uh, because of the fees, uh, um, university fees for students, last demonstrations in France, uh, I think it was 2016, last year, uh, in relation to the change in the labor law with a strong of, um, police repression. You have in 2016, uh, huge demonstrations in Barcelona, uh, 2011, sorry, huge demonstrations in Barcelona, um, anti-austerity measures with 126 per person injured, and uh, one of them, by the way, had an injury in the eye and has to be operated and lost the eye. So what I'm trying to say is that you can consider that the European Union should scrutinize police violence but it cannot be a dog case in this one. And if you, have, if you want to prove that there is a massive violation of um, human rights, the case can be raised, but it has to be adjudicated by courts. It cannot be adjudicated just by a declaration that human rights have been violated. And I'm not condoning at all uh, police violence, not at all. But I think we have to separate, uh, to be very strict in the analysis of the facts before jumping to conclusions. So my interpretation is that uh, perhaps the European Union is not well equipped to intervene here. At least we have a kind of change, total change in the way we scrutinize certain behavior by, by domestic uh, authorities. And um, then finally, I think I have all the points, but I, I wanted to perhaps to, um, to raise something which uh, I had in my presentation, which, which I didn't mention. Which, and the world hasn't appeared in this panel, which is a panel of Spanish or people from the Iberian Peninsula, excluding Portugal which is corruption. We haven't spoken at all about corruption and the influence that this has, not so much in the, in the citizens, but rather in the behavior of political parties. But because not by chance, the two main players in this game, which are the PP and Convergencia Union, are probably, I don't know whether I have an agreement here in the table, are probably the two most corrupt parties in the state. I don't know whether I have an agreement on that. Okay, this is good. We have an agreement on that. So, Mo many of us think that uh, fear of um, the effects of corruption is also fueling a lot this strategy of, uh, of confrontation. And just to quote you one very clear case, the president of uh, the Catalan, Catalan government, uh, Puigdemont, is prosecuted on charges of um, uh, an illegal granting of a contract when he was a major in Girona. And the important thing, the case against Puigdemont was not brought by the Spanish authorities, was brought by the coup, the anti-capitalists, who are their partners in government. So I think this element introduces a, an additional uh, question, question here. And finally, if I am allowed to conclude with uh, Reiner's question, which is a kind of tautological, change institutional change actors, but the question is that institutions cannot be changed from outside. Actors have to change uh, institutions. The problem is that Despite what I said about these uh, strategies of political parties, political parties represent citizens. So at the end of the day, we have a game there which is kind of uh, circular. Um, uh, even if we go for new elections, as uh, I think Guillén was suggesting that would be a likely outcome, probably the, the, the players will be exactly the same. So we have a kind of <laughs> repetition, a kind of, how you say in English, ground, uh, this, this uh, movie in which you are repeating the same day Every, every other day, yes. This, this, this kind of repetition, permanent repetition of, of, the, 
or the past. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. So I don't think that we have an easy way out of that, although an interesting question here, which in relation to something that uh, Marta said that uh, puts them on make call uh, for elections, is what going to, and I think it's a crucial question, what's going to happen to the coalition, just policy and, and, uh, and the relation between Convergencia and Esquerra? Because for Esquerra now, there is a huge temptation to dump the coalition and to go along to elections. And that will make them the biggest part in Catalonia. And very intelligently, if you look at the people who has been accused of uh, any, or charged with anything in this process, no one of them is from Esquerra. So they can make a very intelligent move. They become the biggest part in Catalonia, and they transfer all the burden of this process to Theo, which, by the way, in the, in the polls is, is featuring very, very badly. So that's a kind of political calculation that I think is also behind Puigdemont thinking, or perhaps not, we, we don't know. Um, if I can conclude, uh, I'm pretty happy that uh, we came to this conversation with a very reasonable tone, and uh, this I'm almost sure couldn't happen really in institutions in, in Spain. And that, uh, shows the value of this institution. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. You've preempted my concluding words. <laughs> I was going to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> I think this is, uh, was a very civilized debate. Uh, lots of interesting arguments that have been brought to the table. I have learned a lot, and I hope that goes also for you, wherever you stand uh, on the issues that uh, are now being debated and uh, fought over also in the streets of Barcelona. Thank you to everybody on the panel and also in the audience.